Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's discussion. On behalf of ILAJ, I would like to extend a warm welcome to both the speakers and the participants. Before uh, proceeding to introduce the discussion and the speakers, I would like to take a few moments to introduce our organization ILAJ, our vision and our work. So ILAJ is short for All India Lawyers Association for Justice. It's an organization of legal professionals, including lawyers, clerks, researchers, teachers, and law students. We're a fairly young and recent organization having come together in the summer of 2020. ILAJ was conceived in response to a growing and frightening assault on fundamental rights and constitutional values and a rapid rightward shift in the judiciary and the bar. We hope to take these developments head on through ILAJ, reclaim our constitution, its Ambedkarite values, and forge together a community of lawyers and a model of lawyering which is foregrounded in egalitarian principles of socioeconomic justice. ILAJ also works for the betterment of the larger lawyer community and seeks to work on issues of access, discrimination, and pay. Apart from litigating in the courts, ILAJ also takes principled political stances and releases statements on various socio-political issues from a legal perspective. ILAJ also releases a bi-monthly newsletter where we provide commentary on the latest judgments and legal developments. Over the course of the year, we've also hosted a number of lawyers, academics, and activists from around the world on important and pressing issues of the day. You can find all our statements, newsletters, and discussions um, as the one today on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. The handle is ILAJHQ on Twitter and on Instagram, and All India Lawyers Association for Justice on Facebook. My colleague will link all three below in the chat box, so please have a look and follow us. Um, we also send out emails with all our statements, newsletters, and latest updates. So if any of you would like to receive them, please either send me or Avni, my colleague, your email ID personally on the chat box. Uh, moving finally to the discussion today, we will be discussing the larger themes of a very important and timely book, India's Undeclared Emergency, Constitutionalism and the Politics of Resistance by author and lawyer Arvind Nadeen. The core project of the book is an attempt to understand the present Modi era, which Arvind calls the undeclared emergency, by analyzing in depth the assault by the current regime on principles of democracy, rule of law, and egalitarian constitutional values, and also the capture of civil society and public institutions. Arvind also compares the current undeclared emergency to the previous undeclared emergency of 1975 by listing out the similarities. But more importantly, what he does is list out the dissimilarities between the current emergency and the previous one, laying down for us a fresh and important framework to understand our current times. In many ways, I felt the book was at once a warning for what Arvind says is an upcoming totalitarian future, but at the same time, a ray of hope and guide to how this impending disaster can be resisted through dissent. The last chapter, which is also my favorite chapter, What is to be Done, paints a vivid picture of the different strands and movements of dissent that have blossomed over the years and provides a bouquet of ideas for us on how to deepen and widen our movements of dissent. Um, why we at ILAJ, uh, more broadly as a lawyer's organization, and me personally as a lawyer, felt it important to have a conversation about the themes of this book and the larger prescriptions is because of how it's become a common sense notion that law, politics, and econ economy belong to three different regimes. This common sense notion is then used by law and lawyers to play a huge role in maintaining status quo, be it 1975 or now, and legitimize inhumane laws to the cloak of neutrality and rationality when they're anything but. This book, I think, presents an important counter to that by showing how different laws from the CAA and anti-conversion laws to the labor courts and farm laws are anything but neutral, but are in fact closely aligned to those in power, in this case, Hindutva and the nefarious force of neoliberalism. Another reason why I think the book is so important to lawyers is because of how well it responds to the emotion, which I'm sure many lawyers today in India have, I certainly have it, the sense of hopelessness in litigating and going to the court in the face of continuous and ongoing defeat. The answer the book gives, drawing from lawyers like Michael Swad and judges like Kanna, is a very powerful one. Arvind argues that continuously asserting the rule of law, even in the face of constant defeat, is never in vain. 
because the continuous and daily assertion of it keeps it alive in common imagination and constantly shakes the Red Lane's legitimacy. He also invokes Michael Svard, who says that going to court every day is, is like writing an indictment against the status quo every day. Uh, I'll stop my monologue now with this interesting story I read some time back, Umar Kalia had written it in fact, which ties very neatly into what Arvind says about a human rights lawyer in Chile who all through Pinochet's era kept on fighting cases against him, against him in court. He would keep filing petitions, but he would lose all the cases. But after Pinochet fell, his petitions were used to indict Pinochet for his brutality and crimes against humanity. And today, many, 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 many years later, Chile has elected a left-wing president and is in the process of drafting a new constitution. So there is a lot of hope. I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. We have with us Arvind Nareen. He is a lawyer and he's a writer based in Bangalore. He's a visiting faculty at Azim Premji University. He's the co-editor of Law Like Love and the co-author of Breathing Life into the Constitution and the Preamble, A Brief Introduction. He's currently pursuing a PhD at National Law School, Bangalore, in which he's looking at the legal and political thought of Ambedkar. He was also a part of the team of lawyers that challenged Section 377 of the IPC from the High Court in 2009 to the Supreme Court in 2018. We also have with us Shahrukh Alam. She's a Supreme Court lawyer and she's interested in constitutionality, in criminal law, and its intersections with political power, identity, and class. Uh, Malvika Prasad was our third speaker, but unfortunately will not be joining us today as she's taken ill, but we hope to have Malvika join us for our future discussions. Um, so we'll start, the, we'll start the talk for today. We'll start with Shahrukh's comments and the general themes of the book, and then with Arvind's responses to them. Each speaker will have about 20, 25 minutes. And after that, we'll throw open the discussion to the audience. If any of you have any questions, please send them to me directly along with the name of the person you want to shoot your questions to. Thank you. Sharuk, we can begin. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Arvind, thank you for bringing it all together in your book. And uh, my thoughts today, uh, I think they're going to be as disjointed as your book is structured. I've read the book once and I'm reading it again slowly. So these are, these are, these are thoughts that, that, that are coming to me as I'm reading it. Uh, so, so basically I'm thinking alongside and I'm thinking aloud. And uh, more than discussing the book, these are thoughts that this is where your, your reading the book has taken me. These are thoughts that have occurred to me while, while working with the book. The first idea, the first thought is that you've juxtaposed uh, two big ruptures of the rule of law. But taking the emergency as the first rupture is also politically significant. It's, it's, it's politically symbolic in a way. So I, it's certainly not a false equivalence, but perhaps it's an obligatory equivalence. And, and that is something I want to think about. Uh, you know, there has been an emergency linked to the Congress and now another emergency. But what it also does, I think, is this, this obligatory equivalence lets some people off very easily some people who did vote in 2014 in a particular way are able now to justify their action and say that it's the excess that is the problem. Modi's excesses are now becoming a problem. And you hear about arrogance a lot. He's become arrogant, etc. And it also helps people to distinguish Modi from Vajpayee, the intemperance of, of Modi versus versus the moderation of Vajpayee. So that's something I want to think about by juxtaposing the, the two emergencies, the declared one and the undeclared one. And thinking of the Vajpayee era, I'm also reminded of, of, of Jaitley speaking about civil, civil society and calling civil society the overground arm of the underground. So all of that was there. It's just the excess, perhaps, that was, that was less visible, that was less brazen. So now, when thinking about excesses, 
let's also think about in between the excesses. And, and, and the book deals with that. The book, the book is about that. But I'll, I want to think about the in between, in between the excesses in terms of two very narrow areas of criminal law that I know one or two things about. And I want to think about the constitutional moment as, as a transformative moment, like, like you also talk about it, which is a constant struggle. Uh, isparia or sparen, there's, there's, there's always a constant struggle. But there have been areas which have been completely in the shadow of that transformative moment. And I want to talk about, as an example, one or two things. The first is, what does the transformative constitution do to the idea of equality between the accused and the prosecuting state? So, so what I'm asking really is, when an accused is before a court of law, is she conceptually even equal to the prosecuting state? Am I, am I, an, am I an equal client? Am I an equal party in a court of law? Of course, the current twist is that the, uh, the state often turns around and says to the accused that, yes, of course, you are an equal because you act in a particular way, and the state should therefore also be allowed to act completely outside of the realm of law because, because the accused does that, the terrorists do that, criminals do that. So the state should also be allowed to not follow procedure or not care about human rights or not care about rule of law. But but that's, that's the twist. But even otherwise, in its undistorted form, let's talk about the idea of pre-charge detention, for instance. And that is something that, that, that worries me a lot. I was, I was saying to you yesterday that I spent a considerable amount of time watching Netflix. And just last night, I was watching this really nice uh, film documentary on Netflix. It's called The Unlikely Murderer. And it's about the murder of the Swedish prime minister, Olof Palme in 1986. And there's a scene there, uh, the, the prime minister has been murdered and investigations are on. And the, 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 the person leading the investigation is shown to be a very incompetent, slightly corrupt person who's completely out of his depth in the investigations. But he's narrowed down, his team has narrowed down on one suspect. And the suspect is a 33-year-old extremist who was found just an hour before the murder in the area, sitting in a pub drinking and, and saying that Olof Palme does not deserve to live. So they've narrowed down on him. They've also found gunpowder on his clothes. So he was in the area, he was making a declaration and then he's uh, they, they, they narrow down on him. And this policeman is shown as on his way to a press conference where he's going to, to tell the press that we found our suspect. And just as he's going, his deputy comes in and says that, you know, we were relying on one witness who said that he'd given him a ride from the area just after the murder to some other place. But now he's not a very reliable witness because he's not sure that this was the person. And then the lead investigator stops and he's very upset and he says, but then how will we arrest the guy? If there's one witness and he's not even reliable, how am I going to arrest the guy? And I was thinking, prime minister is murdered. You've got one suspect who's in the area and you've still not arrested that person. You're still collecting witnesses. You're still collecting evidence and you're worrying about how you might arrest the person. And then they didn't arrest him eventually which led me to think about cultures of investigation in the criminal justice system or the culture of the criminal justice system itself. And everywhere it seems to me that the criminal investigation system is understood, it's, it's popularly understood and it's understood in law to owe a duty of care both in conducting the investigation and a duty of care to the accused. In India, throughout the transformative moment, there's no sense of, of any kind of duty of care to the accused or to the investigation. 
increasingly, of course, the line between the convict and the accused is, is blurred. You, you, you pick up a suspect and you treat him as if she is the convict. But even otherwise, even in earlier times, there's no sense of a duty of care owed. I want to read one paragraph. There's, there's, a, there's a judgment called Rakesh Paul versus State of Assam. And Lokur talks about the Code of Criminal Procedure enacted in 1898, which contains section 167, which laid down the procedure to be followed in the event that the investigation into an offense is not completed within 24 hours. What is significant is that the legislative expectation was that the investigation would ordinarily be completed within 24 hours. This is what he says, that complete the investigation within 24 hours, that is, your, that is the expectation. But of course that never happens. 15 days of remand in police custody and th therefore thereafter remand in judicial custody is, is very much the norm. So there is no jurisprudence on the general principles of remand. There is jurisprudence on the general principles of bail and I'll come to that in a moment. But there's nothing much on the general principles of remand to custody, which is, which is taken for granted. So this, this whole idea of pre-charge detention, and I'm always fascinated by the example of Scotland. Scotland allowed for six hours of detention before you press charges. And if you're not able to press charges in six hours, then you have to let the accused go. And that's now been made 12 hours after a lot of debate and discussion. But a report from 2016 says that in Scotland, 83.5% uh, uh, detainees are either pressed with charges within 12 hours or they are let off. You, you can't arrest them, you can't detain them beyond 12 hours. And only 0.5% detentions exceed 12 hours. And they do so in extraordinary circumstances, including terrorist offenses. And I refer you to another very good serial on a uh, series on Netflix called Shetland. There is a terrorist offense. They have to let that person go within 12 hours and then they take special permission and now they can keep him for 24 hours. There was another uh, report, I mean, the same report actually that I've been referring to. It's called Lord Carloway's report of 2016 which says that our culture of investigation does not rely on badgering suspects for information. So, so there's a lot of popular talk around this. What is my culture of investigation? What, what is the country's culture of investigation? England, which is considered very uncivil by Scotland in this matter, allowed for four days, up to four days of pre-charge detention. In terrorist offenses, it's 14 days. And right after the, the London Metro, the London tube blasts, there was again big discussion in Parliament. They wanted to make it 90 days for terrorist offenses. But after the first 14 days, you'd still need to take the permission of a high court judge, not a magistrate, but a high court judge. But even that proposal was rejected in, uh, in the British Parliament. And they said that this is a perfidy and a travesty that you should even be proposing this. For us, it's 90 days, six months under UAPA. And it's a given that, that arrest is the start of investigation. You start badgering the suspect while the suspect is in custody, police custody or judicial custody. I'm reminded of Aryan Khan's case when Aryan Khan was, was arrested. I, I read this on uh, Live Law Twitter actually, and they'd found nothing on him. And when the public prosecutor was asked what exactly you've got against Aryan Khan, he actually said that, how do I know now? I have to first interrogate him, then I'll be able to come back to court and tell you what I've got. So the premise is that you just pick someone up, you badger, 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 and then you make a case. And similarly with the Delhi riot cases, there is a conspiracy, there's a wake conspiracy, we must arrest, we must keep the person for 90 days, not even 90 days, six months now, 
and uh, and badger and and eventually we'll come up with something or we'll not come up with anything and in which case we'll let the person go after six months so coming back to the to the law of remand i think even in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s the the, the judicial culture was that you you give police remand for the asking but it used to be one day or two days or three days at a time. And then, then the accused would be brought, brought back and, and then you'd increase the police demand day by day. But now 15 days is, is given for the asking in one go. So it's not even two days at a time or three days at a time, it's seven days at a time. And then or some, in some cases, 15 days at a time. And, and remand to custody is like I said, almost mechanical. So again, let's compare the general principles of bail with the lack of any kind of principles in law for remand to police custody. And what is the general principle of bail in India? It's the gravity of the offense, which ordinarily in uh, common law has, has no relevance to whether you give someone bail or not. What has gravity of offense got to do with detaining a person when you don't even have enough to charge the person? I was going through the Delhi High Court judgment in Asif Tanha's case, when Asif Tanha was, was, was granted bail. And it's very interesting. There's, a, there's, a, there's almost a section on, the, on general principles of bail, but then the judgment unearths and eventually has to rely on the law of pre-charge detention. But interestingly, they don't rely on any Indian case. They have to go back to, to Halsbury's Laws of England. And I'll again just read out that bit. It says, as a principle of law, arrest or remand of an accused to the custody of the court is done with the express purpose that the accused may face trial for the alleged offense. When the accused is granted bail, he is entrusted to the custody of his sureties who are bound to produce him at his trial at a specified time and place. Thus, the purpose of arrest is to ensure appearance at trial and not as an aid to investigation. It's interesting that uh, the Delhi High Court had to rely on Halsbury's laws of England and they couldn't find any case law, it seems, to, to support this. Now, about remand and about detention, we all had uh, heard about the very unfortunate Tutikorin case where, where, where father and son were beaten to death in police custody. The, the, the primary thing about it that they needn't have been in custody at all, even if they had violated COVID protocols, even if they had violated COVID curfew, they could have been tried and they could have been sentenced. But why were they in police custody? Why were they being interrogated for something that was apparent. But it seems that that is the culture. I had a very interesting uh, discussion with a, with a former student of mine who's now a magistrate in Rajasthan. And he was saying to me, ke, Madam, Rajasthan mein, Western UP mein to ye aise hi hota hai, is liye ke yahan jo lady magistrates hain, shaam ho jati hai, to accused ko unke saamne produce nahi karte hain, kyunke safe nahi hai accused ko produce karna, lady magistrate ke saamne. So ये करते हैं कि उनके घर के बाहर ले आते हैं और वो बैल्कनी से या कहीं से एक बार देख लेती हैं या नहीं देखती हैं and that is how remand is given in the first instance another example section 43d2 of the UAPA which says that the special court will have the power to grant remand beyond 15 days, as opposed to the CRPC, where a magistrate can give remand for 15 days. So there have been cases, uh, in Sudha's case, for instance, where remand was given by, by, by a magistrate or by a court uh, that did not have that power. But yet the courts have, have said that a magistrate can remand someone to police custody, even in a UAPA case, as long as it is for a period under 15, 15 days, because that is covered by 167 CRPC. 
But I heard a very interesting argument being made in court and rejected. And the argument was that the magistrate does not have the power to take cognizance in a UAPA case. So even while giving remand, he, he doesn't really know the case papers. He, he can look at it very cursorily, but he does not know the case. He can't take cognizance. But yet he's given the power to grant remand to police custody. So again, it, say, it, it shows that, that the grant of remand is mechanical. You don't even know what the case is. You can't take cognizance. You can't go through the case papers, but you're still given the right to remand. So I, I, I want to talk about these excesses, the in-between excesses, which are not even considered excesses because they, they seem to form popular judicial culture, popular judicial common sense. Another example, the Puttuswami judgment, and we've, we've all celebrated that judgment, and we've all celebrated the fact that uh, it sets aside ADM Jabalpur. And one of the judges, in fact, who talks about burying it 10 fathoms deep, has also given another judgment in Surendra Gardling's case. Surendra Gardling's case is where the NIA had asked for an extension beyond the first 90 days for, su for submitting his charge sheet. So again, this was detention without charge. This is pre-charge detention. And the same judge says that it doesn't matter that there are infirmities in the application for extension of time to submit the charge sheet. He says it, it doesn't matter because the, the intention is clear. They have not been able to, to complete their investigation. Again, the, the, the excesses are different from the, the, the commonplace, the commonplace thinking of the judicial mind. Um, coming back to the UAPA, there's a very interesting report of March 2020, which says that most countries in, in, in Europe, including England and, and also the US and also Israel, even when they are investigating terrorist offenses, actually don't use security legislation so much. They operate under the, the ordinary laws of the land, the ordinary criminal procedures and, and, and such. And similarly, even in India, the Bombay attack case was investigated and tried under the CRPC, not under TADA, not under UAPA. It was done under the CRPC. But suddenly this whole push towards security legislation to what end, what, what, what is it achieving that could not have been achieved or that other countries don't manage to do under ordinary criminal laws. And here again, Arvind, you, you've spoken about this already, is, is this, this whole thing about uh, getting the UAPA conviction rates high somehow, manufacturing them in a way that, that they escalate. And I have another example to give here. I haven't done so many UAPA cases, but I've, I've done a few. And somehow every time we are made an offer for the client to turn approver. And I had a junior once who said to me, ma'am, kya baat hai, jab hum log jaate hain, ye kehte hain ki approver bana do, hum logon se hi kyun kehte hain aisa. And then we wonder, we figured that hum logon se sirf nahi kehte hain, sab se kehte hain. Jusko arrest karte hain UAPA mein, usse pehle kehte hain ki tum approver ban jao. And, and you don't know what to do at the time because you're looking at long years in jail. And then you're repeatedly being told that if you become an approver, you might get out faster. So every, every accused and, and, and their lawyer goes through a crisis of confidence because, because you are being told over and over again that the only way to save yourself is to become an approver. And I have another, I'm digressing now, I have another interesting story to tell about uh, some of these UAPA cases, which, which aren't directly re relevant, but, but it's, it's an interesting narrative. Again, repeatedly, what we've been seeing is that these, these young boys get arrested, young Muslim boys get arrested. And when you get talking to them, the, the story that comes out is that in Muslim ghettos, 
small towns, Muslim ghettos, suddenly out of the blue, a man appears who's charming and dynamic and who's, who's, who, who, who manages to mobilize a lot of young boys around him and talks to them and, and radicalizes them in some way, but it's all talk. And then there's a raid and all these boys get arrested. But the main person, the anchor, who had managed to bring them all together, he somehow disappears each time. So when a person is asked to, made, to be made a prover, and you're wanting to understand what has happened, and you ask that person, and they say, ke, wo bhai jaan te, wo bahar se aaye te. So where is Bhaijan now? And, and, Every time, Bhaijan is nowhere to be found. Bhaijan has disappeared. And these young boys somehow get, get enmeshed and entrapped. But that's the side story. The fourth point, you talk about the normative versus the prerogative state and lawyers and how they must keep trying to bring the prerogative state or prerogative actors back to the normative. That is, that is what a lawyer is trying to do in, in circumstances like that. But again, my experience has been that, that these are small battles against the excesses, but not against the in-between. Because for every bail that you're, you're fighting for in court, there are many, many, many small things that you let pass. For inst instance, adjournments, uh, for instance, sealed envelopes, for instance, not knowing what the arrest memo says or what the FIR says in a lot of cases, uh, for acting blind against grounds for extension in time or for filing the charge sheet. And you're after the, the, after the bail, the final bail, so you let these little things pass. But each of this little thing goes to form the judicial common sense of the day. And it's, it's, it's understandable because even, even a liberal judge, even a sympathetic judge, treads very cautiously. Even if the judge knows that eventually he or she might give bail to the accused, it doesn't happen on the first day. Uh, you're parlaying, you're stalling. So, so three months or four months, just go because, because we're both the lawyer and the judge are trying to be cautious. So to me, these little things that, that, give you, that, that, that give you something in the end, but they also manage to undermine the, the rule of law in the everyday. Sorry, I'm, I'm just... Uh... The fourth point that, that I want to touch upon is, is this whole thing about Indianization of the, of, the, of the courts, of the Indian courts. And Indianization is basically an empty signifier. It, it can mean anything. But nobody is talking about the democratization of the Indian courts, about trying to bring the accused in a court of law more at par with the prosecuting state. And with that thought, let me now come back again to the, to the first question about, about ruptures, big ruptures and juxtaposing ruptures. I was also saying to you, Arvind, the other day that the, the players in the first emergency, the dissenters in the first emergency, they're all seen together as dissenters. You talk about the disappeared student, you talk about uh, the, the journalist, the, uh, Purkayas, who was picked up from JNU. You also talk about Vajpayee, you also talk about Advani. But, I'm trying to understand what the, the emergency meant to each of them. I think it, it meant very different things to, to, to each of them. 
if you look at the right wing, I think that the constitutional moment was the rupture, not so much the emergency, but, but the, the, the constitutional moment was the rupture from them, for them, because it brought into being a liberal modern state, which is not supremacist. I want to talk about three examples now. Uh, Mr. Sudarshan, he, his name is something else, but I call him the, the, the man from Sudarshan TV. And he's been administ administering oaths to, to children about do or die and, and kill, etc. And when he was questioned about that, he said that there's nothing wrong with this because Shivaji used to do that. And that made me think how the, the reference point always is pre-constitutional rupture. The constitutional moment was the rupture and therefore you, you must refer each time to what happened before. So on the one hand, there is, there is that link to history. Shivaji did this and that's why it's, it's okay to do that in this time and day. And on the other hand is this fear of any kind of mobilization uh, on the other side. The Bhima Koregaon example is, is there. I mean, the, the, the whole case against the BK-16 is about mobilizing forces that, that are seen as a counter to what Shivaji did or did not do. I want to also read the FIR 59 in, from the Delhi riots, which is very instructive in this regard. It says that the co-accused persons instructed the appellant to visit Muslim majority and Muslim dominated areas for mobilization, for part of the, uh, and for, for campaigning as part of the anti-CAA protest. And the appellant also coordinated with local imams to mobilize people for the protest. This is the FIR, this is the allegation against the accused. Where is the offense? Even if you're mobilizing in Muslim dominated, dominated areas, if you're, if you're mobilizing imams of mosques, to, for that to be made into an offense is again instructive. It's again, the, the rupture is not the moment of the constitution. The rupture is in the Hindu supremacist state and therefore the counter mobilization is a problem. So, so just as, a, as another frame to merge with, with the frame that you are working with, Akar Patel's work, for instance, on, on the Hindu Rashtra. But come, coming back to what the emergency meant to members of the current regime, for instance, I would offer that it meant not so much, they didn't have problems so much with, with state power as they did with with the power of a state that they considered illegitimate, that's not supremacist in the same way, because state power in itself is not a problem. And on the other side, for people like the disappeared student, Rajan, the lack of demo dem democracy was the problem. I also want to think about what the state itself was thinking when emergency was declared. It was probably just imagining itself as a modern state, which should have all these powers. And the very final point, it's not even a point, but when you talk about forms of resistance, and of course there's to be resistance in law, but you also talk about cultural mobilization. And what, what I thought of when I read that bit was, was the recent uh, attempts at performing namaz in Gurgaon and the reaction to that. So namaz in public places as also a form of mobilization, as also a form of mobilization against the politics of the day and the immense anger and outrage and violence against that. Is it resistance that is being targeted there? Fine, so these are, these are some initial thoughts, thank you.
Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just asking Madhulika, do you want me to go immediately or do you want to come in now? Or? No, no, Alvin, you can go ahead. Thanks. Thanks to uh, both Madhulika and um, Sharuk for for your for your comments really on the on the book. And um, the way I see the book itself, it's really an invitation to a conversation on two aspects on how do we understand the contemporary moment and what do we do if we're convinced that the contemporary moment, if you want to call it an undeclared emergency, if you want to call it moving towards totality, what do you want to call it? What do we do about it? Those are the two points I try and address in the book. And uh, Shahrukh, in a sense, has got me a lot more into some of the details, which I think are absolutely significant and important, especially as lawyers, to think through. The larger question which she does raise, which I think is an important question, which Madhulika, in a sense, also talks about, is the how do we understand the contemporary moment? And Shahrukh's question to me is that uh, when you say emergency, undeclared emergency, is that uh, necessarily an adequate framework or is there something you're really missing? And is there something else as well? And I think two ways of answering that question. I think the, the, the book also takes the viewpoint that we can find the roots of the undeclared emergency, as Sharuk has indicated, also in the constitutional framework, in particular in terms of Article 22 and the authorization of preventive detention. And of course, the, the point is not that that's the end of the story, but the point is how then do we confine the idea of preventive detention in terms of looking at in terms of both constitutional history, looking at it both in terms of 21, which will be 22, and as well as the other provisions of the other provisions of the fundamental rights chapter, such that preventive detention remains a confined space. And again, there are judicial precedents to this, because in particular, if you look at the ADM, uh, no, I'm sorry, the AK Gopalan's judgment, and look at the dissenting opinion by Fazal Ali, the argument is that we must confine preventive detention to the narrowest possible compass. That's the argument. But again, to use the language of, uh, of both, both uh, Justice Chandrachud in the, in the Puttaswamy judgment, uh, sorry, just as Nariman in the Puttaswamy judgment, where he says that remains still the imagination of a future day. That's not something we have today. So Shahrukh is completely right in terms of a judicial culture, in terms of the way we de deal with these, these issues, be it the question of remand, be it the question of bail, that culture is not there. So I think in one sense, I mean, I completely agree that the, we, the in a sense, the reference point is actually going back to Ambedkar and the invocation of constitutional morality. It's a very important invocation because what is he saying? He's saying that democracy in India is a top dressing on a soil which is essentially undemocratic. And a, we need to cultivate constitutional morality and a people have yet to learn it. So on that point, I'm in agreement. I'm saying that that's the point. We need to be able to say that these liberties matter to our people. And that's the challenge before us. That's why I think in some ways we have to, we have to address the state, but we also have to address society and say, how does this thinking of the importance of liberty become a broader part of a constitutional culture. So there I'm completely in, 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 in agreement with, uh, with, with, with Charuk. The, the, point of the, the point of distinguishing the declared emergency and the undeclared emergency, I'll just make one or two points on that. The one point which people will make, which I think is a fair point, is the declared emergency at 100,000 plus people who were in jail at various points in time in terms of the Shah Commission's recommendations. This torture on a widespread scale. There's no possibility of protest anywhere. So how can you, what is the analogy to call this a period similar to that period in time? How can you even make that case is one kind of a question. And perhaps just a couple of answers on that. The point about the declared emergency is the unconstrained use of the power of the state in terms of detaining people using the Maintenance of Internal Security Act. That's one part of the story. Second part of the story is a complete failure of all the institutions of accountability. Be it the media, which as LK Edwani described it, you asked to bend, you crawled. Be it civil society, which was, which was anyway, which was completely silenced. Or be it the judiciary. And there again, I think the point I make throughout is we look at the, and in a sense, the inspiration for this is, I go back to the point that the inspiration in a sense is really from the people in the most difficult circumstances. And my inspiration in this case is Gautam Navlaka and his entire invocation of Leonard Cohen, where he says, uh, there's a crack in everything through which the light gets in. 
And in terms of the declared emergency, what is the crack through which the light gets in? And one of the cracks, which I, which I, which I look at a little in, in some detail, is of course, the idiom double put judgment was a complete abdication of constitutional responsibility, the majority. But the minority judgment by Justice Kannam was a very important and significant moment where he stood up for the fundamental rights of citizens in a very difficult time. What it tells you is that it is possible, even in the most difficult circumstances, for people to stand up. And as Silver makes the point, he says the 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 judge the, the judgment the minority judgment of of uh, of Justice Kanna was not allowed to be published at the time, which tells you the the importance of it being published. It tells you the importance of the voice getting out. It tells you the importance that the, that voice is out. It gets people together. It helps people to say that, you know, we can resist as well. So the idea that even in the most difficult circumstances, there's resistance is very true of the emergency. And that's one, one point I make with respect to the emergency. If we come from the emergency to what we're calling as the undeclared emergency, the similarity is really this. That's really the point I really, really want to make, which is the idea that the state is unconstrained in its use of the criminal law to confine and detain and imprison dissenters of all stripes and hues. And in particular, I look at the BK-16 as embodying five strands of dissent. And that I think is an important point. I'll just mention that just now to say, what is it that the states find so troubling and so difficult to deal with? If you look at the BK-16 and look at the 16, 16 people who were arrested, what did they embody? What are the kind of philosophies which they embodied? The, one, one aspect of the philosophy is, of course, the Dalit rights activism. If you look at uh, Anant al of course, wider than Dalit rights activism, but Anant al Sudhir Sudhir Davle, as well as, the, as, well as our, our friends from the Kabir Kalam Manch, all of them are deeply critical of the Hindutva project. The point they're making again and again in their writings, in their activism, is really embodying Ambedkar's point, which is a Hindu Raj come to this country, would be the greatest calamity we've ever faced. And the state recognizes the significance of this critique. And it's important that we understand as well, what is it that the state is going after in terms of this particular dimension of dissent? The second dimension is the, the dimension of the, the Adivasi rights activism, which is, of course, Father, Father Stan, uh, Mahesh Rauth, as well as Sudha, 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 Sudha Bharadwaj's work. The third strand would be, I would call the, the, the entire question of the addressing this, the question of civil liberties activism. Again, if you look at the work of Gautam Lamalaka and look at the work of Rona, Rona Wilson, what is the important thing they're doing? They're addressing the issues of, of human rights in very difficult contexts, be it Kashmir, be it the Northeast, or be it Chhattisgarh. The issues nobody else is talking about. They're talking about the deep state, the state within a state, the unaccountable state. And that is something the state finds very, very troubling. The, the fourth point would be the entire question of the clamping down on, on lawyers. Again, what is common to Vern Gonzalez, Arun Ferreira, Sudha Bharadwaj, is the fact that all of them are lawyers. And the state by clamping down on lawyers sending out another kind of message that even lawyers are not exempt from this form of assault because lawyers are very important constituents. Again, we're talking about ILAC, lawyers are very important constituency to keep alive the spirit of dissent and to keep alive the spirit of resistance. And the final strand which the state wants to clamp down on is intellectuals. Why is the state imprisoning Varavara Rao, who's 80 plus years of age? The answer to that comes in his, in his book of poems with a, with a really beautiful forward by Nugiki Wantongo, the, the Kenyan, Kenyan writer, who says, imagination cannot be imprisoned. So the state's attempt is to imprison the imagination. And as Balkopal once put it, he said, we in our society sometimes don't take ideas very seriously. The state takes ideas very seriously. So that's really the imperative behind the state going behind these forms, uh, these forms, of, forms of activism. And again, what is the mode the state is using, which again, I look at in some detail. And that is really the, in this case, two, two particular points, the UAPA and the NIA. That's what I, I look at in, in some greater detail. And, uh, the UAPA we talked about for some for, for a considerable amount of time. So I think people are kind of familiar with it. But the only point I want to make on the UAPA, there are many points to make, but the only point I'll make at this moment is the UAPA is really, 
it's an it's what you'd call a de facto preventive detention law it's a very significant and important point to note preventive detention under the maintenance internal security act the maximum period of detention as was the law allowed was one year the uapa with its bail provisions which make it very difficult to get bail has meant that we have had people who spent over 11 years in jail before being finally acquitted by the sessions court and that's not one example the many examples of that nature so the idea that today you extended preventive detention from one year to a decade of a person's life is the significant uh, implications implication of the uap one of the significant implications i'll just mention that one for now the second point to note is of course which i, which I do look at in some detail is the role of the national investigation agency again i think this needs a lot more research a lot more work and i see this book as an invitation to conversation and we need to do more work on this particular on this particular issue but the point i really make is the nia claims to be one of the most uh, a 90% conviction rate which the tom tom which which the, which the home minister tom tom as talking about the achievements of the nia he will break it down in terms of the studies done by the, the people's union of civil liberties you break it down you realize that firstly they're referring to assuming that in a particular year the 60 cases out of which you get convict out of which you get convictions in in 50 cases they say that's 90% conviction rate leaving aside the fact that there may be 400 cases more pending so okay you take that account then 90% will come down to 27% but even if it's 27% it's quite a significant number why is it significant is because we look at the conviction rates under the porter under tada and other other under other terrorism laws is as low as 2.5% so 27% seems very very high and here we come to a very very troubling phenomenon which again is coming through in terms of some of the academic research in in, in this area uh in in scholarly journals uh, article by kunal ambasta in fact makes the point that one of the strategies used by the nia nia is what he calls cutty which is the idea that you tell a person you spent 5 years in jail now you spend another 5 years in jail or you plead guilty so the person is present with the hobson's choice what does the person do what do lawyers advise the clients it's a very difficult question what as a lawyer what do you tell your client do you say that you know you 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 don't stand up to the nia or do you say that you go ahead i think most lawyers will say that you make a call because we can't make a call for you and people sometimes people most people end up pleading guilty which means the nia gets a higher conviction rate so there are, these are the problems with the use of what we call the the heart of the prerogative state in terms of the nia and the ua uap in this particular uh, and its use by this regime and i think the problem why this becomes such a big issue why we call it an un undeclared emergency is the uap and the nia have been allowed to function untrammeled unconstrained by any check whatsoever parliament is not a check media is not a check and most fundamentally the judiciary is not a check and that's really the point we want to make about why this is the period of an undeclared emergency and i go a little bit i'm not going to talk about this now i go a little bit into the role of the judiciary and the failures of the judiciary over this period in time and how there are many parallels between adm jabalpur then to the failure to take a fundamental cases today the failure to live up to the initial small dawn of constitutional morality and the and and the and the failure in to of course challenge the unconstitutionality of, of the uap and then i and the fact that indian citizens are spending decades in jail how is not how is that not of concern as far as the higher judiciary is concerned is a question is a question which of course comes to mind and of course in the failure of the judiciary what looms large is 370 the failure to hear that say the failure to hear that and i think this litany of failures we know i'm not going to go uh, go any further into into that at this current this current moment uh difficult as this is the point i really want to make is that uh, the current moment takes us one step further poses even more fundamental challenges than the challenges we have now the one way of analyzing within the framework of authoritarianism or the de declared and undeclared emergency the current regime and the and the and the, and the indira gandhi regime is that as a species what you call as authoritarianism 
Authoritarianism, again, the framework used by Juan Linz, the point that he makes is that you're talking about unconstrained or you're talking about the idea of, of uncontrolled discretion as far as the ruler at the top is concerned. And that's, that, of course, embodies both the then regime and the current regime. We're seeing that in terms of the uncontrolled discretion in terms of decisions, such as maybe the decision to impose unplanned lockdowns, decision to impose monetization comes from the top with a, with, with a shock as it were. And you have no, you're not able to do anything about it. That's the power, of, it links a certain kind of populism with a certain kind of authoritarianism and authoritarian populism, you can call it that. That's obviously very common to both regimes. But what is different, what is remarkably different with both regimes, which is very important to acknowledge, is that uh, Gyan, Gyan Prakash makes the point that end of the day, the emergency was received, was received by people with a level of, was the acceptance by people was sullen at best, not enthusiastic. I don't think we can make the case that the acceptance of this regime is solid, which takes us to the fact that though this regime is authoritarian, it's something beyond authoritarian as well. As well. And that's again going back to one Linz's framework. He distinguishes what he calls authoritarianism and totalitarianism. And totalitarianism, again, what he describes as totalitarianism is a regime which is founded in a certain kind of an ideology, which has a certain kind of a popularity, which relies a lot on civil society for its mobilizing. That is, it's not just based on the coercive part of the state. It's about the militarization and the em emboldenment of civil society as well. It's about the power of the mob, which becomes a central actor. And fundamentally, it's also about the question of, you know, how you alter the economic status quo to the detriment of those who are poorest in this country. I just take you through these four points just quickly to make the point of what is so distinctive and even more troubling about this current regime than the than the than the than the emergency regime. I mean, rooting in in, in, a, in an ideology, we can say that this again, uh, Christopher Jaffalo makes the point that Indira Gandhi's regime, rooting in socialist ideology, was very shallow. It wasn't really there. Nobody can make the case that the rooting of this regime in Hindutva ideology is anything but shallow. I mean, it, it's definitely shallow. It, it is, it is, nobody can make the case that it's shallow. It has deep rootings. But the, the point really, again, is what do we mean by rooting in Hindutva ideology? What is Hindutva ideology? Again, people know we can reference Kulwalkar, we can reference Savarkar, but the point I would take it at a slightly different level and say the important point we need to recognize about rooting in this form of ideology is an ideology which is fundamentally opposed to difference in diversity. It's an ideology which is a war with diversity and that's its fundamental nature. Again, this is a point which uh, Bhikkhu Parikh makes in his, in his description of totalitarianism. He says, what is totalitarianism? Totalitarianism cannot tolerate a student asking a question in the class. It cannot tolerate a comedian making a joke in public. It cannot, it cannot tolerate what Shah Rukh described, a Muslim, praying in public. It cannot tolerate a Christian practicing his faith. He cannot tolerate a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender person who, who says, I am different from your heterosexual norm. All these forms of diversity, what this current regime will say is I am war at, because that is the imperative of a totalitarian regime. The second point I want to make is that the, the regime is, is a popular regime. And again, this is an important point, because if we understand Fascism, if you want to use the language of fascism, as something which has no roots in people, that'd be a fundamental mistake. Hitler and Mussolini were deeply popular, pop popular regimes. And I think this regime has a certain analogy with that sense of popularity, as far as uh, its, uh, its very, very DNA and its very uh, structure is concerned. Again, there's a very powerful uh, point which, which, which Hannah Arendt makes, which says that a collective tyrant, which spread through the length and breadth of the country, can be as dangerous, as, as, as divisive, as problematic as a single tyrant sitting in the center of power. And today we have in that sense, beyond the question of the state, we have the collective tyrant which spread its tentacles throughout, throughout, throughout society. The, uh, the third point I wanna make, let me just get to my third point, sorry, one second. Uh, 
again, we know this. When I said rooting in an ideology, ideology is one part of it. Second part of looting, rooting in certain form of organizations, which of course are the RSS and its networks. And of course, the part of the mob. Because the mob is an actor at the level of the, of the larger, political, uh, larger political level. And that poses again a very fundamental challenge to the way we take forward uh, our vision of democracy or human rights. Because the mob as an actor is something which of course, again, would need to be challenged, need to be constrained, need to be brought within the checks of the, of the, of the constitutional order, order, order itself. And the final point I'll make, make with respect to what, what makes this regime very, very distinct is again, here I think the similarities to the previous regime, but the, not the Indra Gandhi regime, but the Rajiv Gandhi regime onwards, which is the rooting in a certain ideology of neoliberalism, because this regime, again, we've seen during the lockdown, again, the, 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 uh, the idea of the, which Naomi Klein calls the shock doctrine, that is during a lockdown, the state uses power to push through legislations and laws, which further marginalized the most marginalized. We have the examples of the farm laws, we have the assault with respect to the, the draft EIA and the, the clearance of a range of projects with deep environmental implications as far as people are concerned. We have the assault on labor laws with the entire passing of the, of the, of the labor code itself. So we see the fact that, you know, the, there's a way in which Though we're referring to the cultural and the social and the political, the economic is very significant and very, 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 very important as well. So I'll end with this and make I'll make a couple of last points, which is which is Madhulika referred to the last part, which says what 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 can we do? What can what are some of the ideas? What what we can do? Again, this is a way of initiating our conversation. These are not the these are just some ideas to begin that process of thinking, and. Uh, one which Shahrukh already referred to is the idea that we must redouble our defense of the normative state. We have to defend the normative state against the ravages of the prerogative state. And the normative state in this case would, would mean, of course, the, the constitutional, constitutional framework and would mean the ideas in the preamble, be it liberty, equality, fraternity, or dignity. Absolutely fundamental ideas. We need to understand them better. We need to communicate them better. We need to be able to, in a sense, defend the sense of these ideas in their everyday practice. And Madhulik already referred to the, uh, I, I, again, sometimes when you look at what is going on within the country, it's very difficult. So I think part of what the book tries to do is saying that we are rooted in a, in a, in a moment, but we must have an imagination which looks, looks beyond the moment. So I've gone outside, I've gone in terms of history, I've gone both in terms of comparative, comparative activist examples as well. And in particular, I've gone to the Israel-Palestine example as well as the, as well as the activism against apartheid. And the point which, uh, which you learn from our activist friends from Israel-Palestine Israel, Israel -Palestine, is that you have to keep at the, as what Madhulika indicated, to keep asserting the rule of law, because some point that that point that ex, that will come in, that will come in as, as very very important. The indictment of the status quo is something you can't give up on. You're keep indicting the status quo with a vision, which is about a vision about protecting the, the fundamental rights as it were. So that's one part of it in terms of defending the normative state against the ravages of the prerogative state. But the second point which I want to make, I think I'll just make it quickly here, is the, the entire question of the question of inequality as well. Again, if you look at the larger point, right? Why do we have this rise of these forms of populism around the world? India is not an example, is not, not an outlier. There's India, there's Brazil, there's, there's uh, Turkey, there's United States, it's countries around the world. And one of the answers is provided by this remarkable text by Thomas Piketty called Capital and Ideology. And the point he makes is that the period just prior to the, the First World War was one of the most unequal periods the world had seen after the French Revolution. And the levels of inequality were unsustainable, and it finally resulted in World War One, World War Two, and then the long process of fight back, wherein the inequality was brought within within lower and lower levels, and that of course the, the formation of the Soviet Union and the social democratic liberal, liberal forces within uh, within the within within the Western European context. And the point he's making is this long reduction of inequality, which began in the 19, uh, 1940s and was uh, right up to the 1980s, began the reversal with uh, Reagan and Thatcher. And today he says the levels of inequality we're witnessing are very similar, almost very similar to the levels of inequality which you saw during, uh, during the period just after the, after the French Revolution. So that raises the question, 
that fundamentally this cleavage based on, 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 on economics will have to be factored in in terms of any strategies we have, we, we, we have in terms of the time, uh, time, time going forward. And I'll make one, end, one final point and end with this is, uh, is again, what is the power of the ideology of Hindutva? Where does it derive its power from? You know, and again, I quote Yeetsun's point to say the best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And there's a certain power the ideology has that draws people in. Where, where does that power lie? And again, I go back to Arendt and her invocation of uh, what she called in Origins of Totalitarianism as, again, she's one of, the, I go a lot to her in this particular book. And because she's one of the important thinkers who's philosophizing against the background of totalitarianism. And the point she makes is really this. She says that what is the power of a totalitarian ideology as far as human beings are concerned? It relies on a certain kind of psychological state which she calls isolation and what she calls loneliness, two states, right? Uh, when she talks about isolation, what she means is that there's a way in which fundamentally you're disconnected from everybody else. You're not with the world, the world is not with you. You don't feel connected to anybody, anything in the world. You're atomized, you're disempowered, and you feel a sense of powerless, powerlessness. And it's some precisely among when people are in this kind of a state that, in, that a totalitarian ideology has that kind of ability to draw you in, has an ability to make you feel that you're larger than yourself. You're someone who has some who has a larger stake than being just this particular individual who has a particularly difficult life, and you're instead part of a larger Hindu community. And that's the sense of power which, which this particular ideology has. It's an antidote to what she calls describes as loneliness, which is a fundamental condition of basically being disconnected from the world. And perhaps we can even think in terms of the uh, the people who've been arrested with respect to the to the Suli deals and bully deals, etc. Right? The idea of isolation might be very central to the way they uh, they function. Mandulika, am I going over the over the top, over the time? No, 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 no. I just I just okay. switched on my camera. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, right, right. I, I'm I'm winding up in three minutes. Don't worry. Um, um, yeah. So the addressing the question of uh, loneliness would be one dimension of the way we way we think about this going forward. The Second one, which I think is very important, which is why Elijah, I think, comes in a range of organizations really come in, is breaking what is called a sense of, what she calls a sense of isolation. What she means by isolation is a psychological state where you feel completely disempowered to do anything which can change the world or which can work with the world at all. So you say that, you know, I can't do anything. So I retreat to my own private universe because nothing I do Will change this will change all to the status quo so what is very important is to break that sense of isolation i'll give you an example which communicates the sense of isolation uh, again going back to one of our very important human rights lawyers Kanab, uh, mr kanabaram there's a documentary by deepa dandraj about him and uh, his wife says this so during the emergency she describes this is what happened she says during the emergency the sense of fear was so high that kana's best friends if they saw him in the corridors in court they look at him and go the other side because nobody wanted to be associated with him. And that's putting you in a space of isolation. So if that is the case, then our imperative is to really break that sense of isolation. So how do we come together in groups or in association to say we're going to challenge the contemporary, the contemporary kind of a setup or we're going to work towards preserving constitutional values, how it used to phrase it. So the uh, idea is breaking off a breaking of the sense of isolation. And again, uh, going back to Arendt, she puts it this way. She says that the, the, the fundamental success of the Nazis was to make everybody believe that a protest was without any value. By that, they murdered the moral person in man and they ensured that solidarity died. So how do you cultivate solidarity? How do you build a sense of fraternity? Those are the challenges that should be there. Uh, before us. Okay, I'll end with that. Thanks. Thank you, Arvind, and thank you, Sharuk, for this fantastic and insightful discussion. I'll open it up for uh, comments and questions now to the audience. So if any of you have comments or questions, please uh, raise your hands, and then I'll call your name out, and then you, could, then you can go ahead. Um, Kavita Ma'am has a question.
Okay, we can wait, we can circle back. Keshav, uh, Keshav, go ahead. Keshav, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, okay, I was trying to unmute. I could not unmute till now. Um, Madhulika, should I go ahead? Go ahead, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, yeah, I was trying to unmute me myself. Uh, I just, uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, the observations that Charuk made uh, were uh, extremely insightful and uh, useful. And of course, uh, Arvind's book, I think, is a must read uh, um, in a sense that it isn't just analyzing um, where we stand today, but uh, it is, in fact, a call to understand in order to organize for change. And that is what I find uh, very inspiring about it. And um, just a couple of uh, small things which struck me. Um, Narendra Modi in his uh, recent, uh, he gave a speech on the occasion of this uh, 75 year celebrations of India's independence. And he made a particular statement there, where, uh, which is very, very uh, you know, interesting. Because he said that in the last 75 years, we only kept talking about rights, fighting for rights and wasting our time. And now we should focus on duties. So, um, you know, in a way, you know, here we are, here is this book that is looking back at India's history as a republic and uh, at how we got here. And here is a prime minister who is presiding over this particular fascist moment who is looking back at that history and saying, you know, what a waste of time. People who are fighting for rights are Andolan Jeevis, basically, <clears throat> you know, wasting the nation's time. And uh, it is a part of this general ideology of not undermining uh, any kind of discourse of rights. Uh, and so whether you, he's talking, whether the Sangh is talking about Gandhi or Ambedkar, it's, uh, I have noted over a period of time, you know, the uh, comments that Modi has made about both Ambedkar and Gandhi. And I've noticed that uh, Gandhi is reduced to this whole toilet business. And uh, Ambedkar, he will keep uh, claiming on Ambedkar's behalf that Ambedkar did not want to, you know, he, he uh, compares Ambedkar to this some uh, figure in uh, Gujarat, uh, you know, uh, history or something like that, who is a Dalit person who gives up his life. Uh, and he says, you know, he is, uh, Ambedkar fought for assimilation into Hindu uh, society. He didn't fight for, he didn't keep demanding something. So this whole notion that demanding your rights, you know, demanding something is a bad thing. It's a morally flawed thing. This is uh, going to, you know, this isn't just him saying it. This is clearly a uh, signal to us that this is uh, something that is going to be majorly pushed as an ideology. Um, that's one thing. The other small thing I had in response to Shah Rukh was that absolutely, I think there's no, uh, I don't think it can be anybody's case that uh, the emergency under Indira Gandhi and uh, Narendra Modi's regime now, that there are not major differences. I think it, there are huge, uh, obviously, enormous differences in the sense that um, the, you know, the, the uh, emergency regime, uh, the very fact that it had to be declared meant that uh, the regime knew that it is something not popular, not supported by uh, the people. Whereas right now, uh, you know, there is the whole, we are up against this myth that, uh, you know, this, this whole uh, construction of the happy citizen and the fact that the citizen is happy with this, or as Ram Madhav puts it, you know, the mob is happy. So there's that. But I think that what I find in Arvind's book uh, to be useful is to see, not just to just compare and see, okay, it was like that then and it's like this here. But in a way, understanding how this, uh, you know, what Shah Rukh said, that the state just thought they could do this. The state uh, in a, Indira Gandhi's time thought that a modern state should have the right to do this, to behave in an authoritarian fashion. Um, 
the thing is that by doing not just that but you know the the uh, in the period of emergency but in general uh, all these years prior to the modi regime's coming to power the erosion of the idea of the constitutional rights and uh, the attack on constitutional rights and the whole erosion of the constitutional culture or the attempt to foster that culture the uh, uh, attacks on the attempts to foster that culture they have contributed to landing us here and so i suppose that when we are organizing to fight back i keep thinking that it can't just be a defensive fight to go back to the way things were but it has to in fact offer uh, something that is a better future a uh, a uh, uh, you know contest the notion of what is a good what is a good society what is a moral society contesting the idea of, of both the hindu rashtra as well as business as usual indian state right yeah should i madhulika should i add something yes yes of course thank you thank you kavita no i i completely agree with what you are saying and i i just want to clarify i i i feel that arvin's book captures the the differences and it, it does it in a very comprehensive way in terms of how you also talk about authoritarian versus totalitarianism but i'm and it's 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 not properly formulated in my own head but i'm trying to think about whether even the the violation of the rule of law suspension of the rule of law even captures all that is wrong uh with regimes so so in terms of hate speech for instance hate speech and rule of law and when you go to court challenging hate speech and when you're speaking in the language of rule of law or constitutionalism then you're up against akbar owaisi and his speech versus yati narsinghanand and his speech but the point the, the the political social point that that akbar owaisi's speech can be very very communal could be violent it could be provocative but it's it cannot be genocidal it cannot be hate speech because he doesn't have the resources at this point of time to back what he's saying whereas yati does and i am trying to suggest that perhaps these inflections of power are not fully captured by a mere suspension of rule of law there's 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 something more here that that we need to perhaps talk about also i i don't think i'm being very clear but i'm i'm trying to to say that there's a social political historical angle also to to where we are and where we were during the emergency which is not fully captured by uh, the frame of constitutional morality keesha seems to have a question i think would you like to respond to it before i yeah, yeah quickly very very quickly sure, sure. point only on the uh, the question of rights because i felt it's an important one to respond to how do we think of rights right and the often the the point i think of the of the of the modi invocation is we think of rights as somewhere western is not rooted in our culture not rooted in our tradition that's the that's the way of thinking about it so i would argue that we need to think of rights as really rooted in struggle and really a product of struggle and the struggle again the again, way bargopal puts it his rights don't emerge unless there's struggle somewhere and the way again kanabran puts it he sees the constitution as really a product of certain kind of a uh, the the constitution part of a certain kind of a struggle the independence struggle right and this is not just the independence struggle the struggle which has an external dimension and an internal dimension if you look at something like say 152 uh, which is the the prohibition of the of the discrimination on grounds of uh, caste by practice by any citizen etc right caste religion etc all the other markers uh, that would really come from the struggle against caste violations by uh, headed by headed by ambedkar so there's a way in which we would think of the constitution as a or human rights as really a product of a struggle and say we defend it as really embodying that 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 that, that, that struggle as it were you know yeah. as end with yeah. and just to add to that very briefly i i also want to say that even even the duty is again an empty signifier duty could be to it could be a duty of constitutional care which is a running theme 
through, through the whole thing on constitutional morality. But when he speaks of duty, it's always the duty of the citizen towards him, but not the state's duty to, 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 towards constitutional care. Just, uh, I'll just add to that one more quick point on that is, uh, again, there's a, there's a chapter in the constitution called fundamental duties. And if you're saying that we're thinking in the language and rights and duties within the, within the terms of the constitution, the fundamental duties, for example, are to renounce practices derogated to women. Fundamental duties are, for example, to uh, foster a, con a composite culture, to and to the environment, the et cetera. Scientific right? temper, all of that. Yeah. Scientific, te scientific temper, importantly, yeah, in this particular case, to, uh, to, uh, to think of the values of the freedom struggle, to to respect the values of the freedom struggle. See, these are our, our fundamental duties. If you want to put it within the language of the constitution, of course, that's not the way, that's not the, the way the prime minister is thinking. But if you think it within the terms of the constitution, fundamental duties could mean something, a duty could mean something very, very different. Thank you so much, Arvind. Uh, Clifton, who is the national convener of ILAJ, would like to, has a question. Clifton, you can go ahead. You're unmuted. Ah, okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Madhulika, for, uh, for moderating this. And really, thank you, uh, Shahrukh and, uh, and Arvind. It was just an absolute delight to listen to both of you. And I think, in a way, uh, uh, in a sense, I think, you know, what really comes out of this is the kind of challenge, even as litigators, or even as people who belong to the legal fraternity, I think the challenge that lies before us is quite clear. I think one is in terms of even understanding where we are at. And secondly, how are we even going to begin to address this? Uh, the Just one thing I'd like to say here is, um, in fact, uh, Arvind, uh, when he talked about Kanna, uh, Kannabiran and uh, the way in which he was treated at the time that he was representing those who were detained during the emergency, I think that's a very, very, uh, it's a very important uh, uh, experience for us to understand. And I think... Uh, Today, we are at a phase in our country where we see the legal fraternity is also one that is, uh, that is part of this, uh, that is also seeing the, uh, seeing the impact of uh, this undeclared emergency. So I don't think that the legal fraternity as it exists is completely divorced from this entire radicalization that's taking place, uh, from the infiltration by a lot of the uh, fascist groups uh, uh, that we see around us. To give a small example, I think, you know, there if one talks about you know uh, BK16 and the assault, uh, the attack on the lawyers, whether it is uh, Surendra Gadling, whether it is uh, Sudha, uh, whether it's uh, Verne, Arun Ferreira, for instance, I think the attack is not just limited to that. And there are four things that I want to just share here. I'll make this and then another point. Number one, I think uh, last year, the raids that happened on the offices of Mahmood uh, Pracha, advocate Mahmood Pracha, who's handling the Delhi rights case, for me, I think that was a very, very important uh, the moment. And I don't think that it was a one-off case. The fact that the police uh, found it, you know, was emboldened to go into, uh, to raid the office of an advocate who was representing the victims in the Delhi, the Delhi rights case and almost uh, threatening that you have to breach the advocate-client confidentiality. I think there's really, there's much to be said about that in so far as the uh, in, uh, insofar as the threat that even advocates who are now conducting these political trials, you know, who are part of this, who are trying to fight this in the legal arena, the way in which they're facing it. The second, I think, is the growing examples of uh, bar associations passing um, resolutions that they will not allow anyone to represent a particular kind of uh, accused. And this is, one sees this not, uh, one sees this in Chhattisgarh where uh, Bar Association says you cannot, you know, they'll pass a resolution say you cannot uh, represent those who are accused of uh, who are, uh, uh, suspected Maoists or Kashmiri students who are accused anywhere in the country. Where in Agra right now, we are seeing what's happening to those uh, three students over there. So these resolutions and the way in which these bar associations are being captured by the right wing, I think is a matter of great concern for the legal fraternity. The third, I think, is in, and I think in a, in a much more uh, advanced uh, stage of attack uh, that the legal fraternity faces is in Kashmir. If you look at what happened uh, in 2019 and August 5th when the, uh, when, uh, when the abrogation took place, 
it was it was uh, uh, parallel to that were the arrests of Kuyum of Abdul Kuyum and Nazir Rongta, who were stalwarts of the of the bar over there. You know, way of so I think you know one really has to be very conscious of the way in which one the legal fraternity is already being attacked in this country, and secondly the manner in which the legal fraternity is also being radicalized, and that's something I think you know in this moment. Whether we want to call it a totalitarian time or an authoritarian time, the fact is that this is something that we need to deal with. The second point that I wanted to make was uh, this, and I think you know Arvind actually in his uh, in his last chapter in the book, uh, what what is to be done, he refers to uh, in defense of the normative state, where he rely where you rely upon uh, uh, Ernst Frankel and his book, the dual state. You know, actually, it took me back. You know, when I'm uh, and I feel. If you also look at the references, the number of references that that are there in this book to what happened in Nazi Germany. So I think we are actually looking at three ruptures here. You are looking at Nazi Germany, you are looking at emergency, and looking at today. And in a way, I think you know uh, Ernst Frankel. In, if you if you were to even uh, if one were to see the kind of life that he led, you know, in, a Jewish advocate who fought cases uh, uh, in 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 Nazi Germany, and in fact, in 1933. When uh, when lawyers were disbarred, there was basically an occupation ban. A fantastic book called Lawyers Without Rights that's been written by uh, Simon Ludwig Winters about it, which documents this. In that book, there's a very interesting anecdote about Ernst Frankel. That the uh, in 1933, when the Jewish advocates are barred from practicing law, there is one window left open, and that window is that you apply for readmission, and but you have to swear allegiance to the government at, at that point. and the only other window is that if you were a veteran of the world war 1 now ernst frankel of course was a veteran of world war 1 so he, he he applies for readmission but in his admission he actually said he does not swear allegiance to the government that act of resistance at that time i think that is something that is absolutely uh, remarkable and in a way i think you know when we are talking about all these uh, of the legal fraternity in this fight back i think we have to go back in time we have to draw inspiration from even these of you know these moments where advocates stood up where law, the legal fraternity stood up in the face of even fascism i think your book actually uh, gives the hope and sharuk's practice in that sense you know is something that really inspires all of us you know that that this possibility is there you know this the the resistance is not over if people have not given up we are not going to you know bow down to this kind of uh, attack and we are going to fight you know, to ensure that this country of ours that the dream that was there at the time of freedom it actually is realized in this country so i thank you both i mean just on behalf of ilaj and all of us here it's just fantastic uh, that you wrote this book and thank you sharuk for your fantastic uh, presentation thanks madhulika thank you thank you thank you sir keshav has a quick question keshav i have unmuted you so you can go ahead is on a point that uh, as she said earlier uh, i'm so sorry about, Keisha, we're not able to hear but, you uh, can you hear me now yes yes go ahead okay long live the nazi party okay i think that was a troll uh and i'm very sorry for that um let's uh vedika seems to have a question vedika please go ahead uh hi am i audible yes yes thank you so much uh, first of all i think this interaction has been absolutely insightful so thank you so much for everybody who has spoken up till now um my question specifically draws from what sharuk ma'am and arvind sir talked about recently uh, starting from the point of uh, you know i think 2019 onwards the country has seen a lot of instances where um, we have seen excesses happening in a lot of different forms and that's what i would like to focus on right now first of all uh, i want to throw some light on the disharavi case basically and uh, the bail issue the uh, the case of her bail was uh, it came to light 
um, you know, very strongly, and it was highlighted by a lot of different people, specifically because the additional sessions judge, uh, Justice Dharmendra Rana, uh, gave this very extensive explanation as to why he was granting this bail uh, to Disha Ravi. And that was discussed uh, a lot, specifically because there was this question as to why a judge had to give such a long explanation when um, the facts of the case very clearly suggested that the chances of uh, conviction here were very, very low. And, uh, you know, the, the judge gave this very long explanation as to he, he reinvoked the idea of uh, bail is the norm and jail is the exception. And he also spoke about uh, what was said by Justice Guire in the Mehrendu Dutt Majumdar case of 1942, uh, wherein it was said that sedition cannot be invoked to minister to the wounded vanity of the government. Now, uh, this is something that I've read a lot about, which is why I thought it would be very relevant to bring it up here. And uh, we talked about how, you know, you should have, uh, when, when you look at what is going on around you, you should still have uh, an imaginative outlook and uh, be able to imagine a future that is better than the present, uh, which is what Arvind sir also spoke about. And my question is 1942 and 2021. Uh, we have pretty much the same problems coming up. We may have seen a better period in between when, you know, immediately after independence, the country was perhaps in a much better state from this point of view, maybe not economically, maybe not in other senses, but in this specific sense, the country was doing a lot better. And now today, I feel like we're reverting to the age of, you know, oppression. And uh, this also brings in the idea of how this addition law, uh, much like the UAPA and uh, the NIA, is being used to uh, establish the state as something above the individual, which again is something that Ms. Uh, Sharuk uh, Ma'am talked about, you know, is the accused actually at an equal footing uh, with the state. Now, related to this, and this is something that I'm wondering about, and this is uh, my main question, is this in some way linked to what we uh, discussed regarding where Hindutva and, you know, the current regime, the popular regime, finds its authority and where it derives its authority from because we're talking about something called you know soft power which is uh, basically known as manufacturing consent the ability to manufacture consent and that is how the popularity of a country uh, of a of a regime grows but is this really soft power that we're seeing right now is uh, i because i feel like you know these instruments that were supposed to create a good society, a harmonious society, are being used by the government to create the consent that they want, except it's not happening, you know, softly. So uh, I, I'd like to ask for your take on that, ma'am and sir. Any one of you can go ahead. Do you want to just take a couple of questions together and then? Sure. Um, Arunav, do you want to go ahead with your question? I'll unmute you. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. I'm Arunav. I'm also looking forward to joining Arvind sir as a student with him at his institution soon, hopefully by the next year. But my question is based on the fact that whether this path will always lead here. What I mean by that is that, you know, when we create a distinction between the liberal establishment that existed before this time and the extremism that exists on the right today. We necessarily, necessarily dictate that one is better than the other, right? One is more preferably the, uh, preferable than the other. But in our view of history, as we know it, doesn't one always lead to the other, right? Like, and doesn't this fact all like necessitate that we have a more radical view. What, what I mean by that is that why shouldn't we understand that if, that if we cite, truly cite Dr. B. R. Ambedkar and Arantya Tume, why shouldn't we understand the judiciary as and the constitution as being flawed and supremacist since their conception, not only being misused, but also being flawed and supremacist since their conception, uh, you know, because and because and being flawed in the sense that think about it this way for example we you know the fundamental rights as important as they are are at the end of the day individual rights right and individual rights are not the same as collective rights 
and a hyper focus on individual rights wouldn't that lead to the same kind of alienation or isolation that we were talking about that leads to this you know sort of fascist development because you're citing both anand tel tumbe and dr bhr ambedkar who have a radical framework in mind but at the same time we are citing arend and naomi klein who have you know an anti communist uh, sort of lean in their writings right they they uh, they make the mistake of sometimes comparing nazi germany to the soviet union in the case of arend or naomi klein in believing in like defanging sort of capit capitalism and identifying capitalists as the issue rather than capitalism so if you're putting all of this and like creating basically a mixed soup instead of having a principled radical approach you know isn't that more fruitful of a, a, a focus on collective rights rather than individual rights uh, you know and a principled approach yeah, because you know we can talk about state excesses and as important as that is but what about judicial bias since its conception because our judiciary has since its conception protected the rights of the land owning class the upper caste the so called upper caste so and it has been again the judiciary has been seated by them as well yeah we got your point we got your point yeah yeah thank you so much um abai uh, do you want to go uh, next and uh, just just a request to everyone just because of uh, concerns of time just keep your question short please uh, abai uh, i'm just unmuting you yeah hi thanks uh, i just have a brief uh, comment just a jo a very joyous comment that was prompted by the panelists uh, and it used like two terms as a point of reference which is what prompted me to raise my hand um, on the point of signification and isolation um, so what led me to also um, enjoyably relate and understand this and equipping myself with a certain language and or rather being inspired right by a lot of the uh, people maybe right in this meeting also and it's, it's very great to uh, uh to see such events happening is um a psychoanalytical uh, which is what like the word signification or rather that's what it's more popularly used for uh, i have learned uh that 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 how politically that like there are some certain signifi signifiers that uh, um that the uh, right uses and when it comes to right and as uh, arvind was mentioning as to what gives the right uh, x y z more power or why are more people attracted to right uh, is that i've come to understand i've learned also rather equipping myself with like certain terms that uh, that the right in a way does enjoy more the people in the right do enjoy more the, the desire so in a way what i've learned is that even so from the left or like from any other from any kind of movement wise a movement wise is very important just as how you know to not be isolated is also like how to enjoy like the point of enjoy here is used very technically the word enjoy so i'm just saying that it's very enjoyable you know to to understand for us to take certain steps like this to collectivize and to uh, and there's a certain saying also that um, uh from the left right or like from uh, basically any progressive that even when you lose you win right so that that uh that form of ideology and etc so i just wanted to like it prompted me so i just wanted to just kind of like put it out there that uh, psychoanalytical tradition and you know signifies uh, uh to understand uh subjectivization right and the uh, in the context of our struggles has uh been a lot and like i large and like the people within this have been uh, very inspiring so i just want to just kind of like you know, a very brief comment thank you thank you so much abai that was so nice um arvin and sharif would you like to go ahead i'm also so sorry uh, to the others there are three four questions on the chat box so maybe we'll be able to take that uh, and not any more questions but arvin and sharif you can go ahead now and then i'll just collate the questions on the chat box and relate to you after yeah no uh, just to come quickly to say thank you for all the thoughts and comments a lot of this involves i mean as i keep saying the point of this book is to begin a discussion not to provide any final answers at this particular moment the only comment i'll just come in a little bit on is the is i mean the, i think there's a framing framing argument as far as the book is concerned is how do you view the the constitution right and there is i mean i know very clearly that this is a radical tradition which views the constitution as fundamentally flawed as deeply problematic as a, as in a sense as being a part of the problem as it were there, there is that strand of opinion 
the strand of opinion which I've taken in terms of the way I've, I've made my argument in this particular book is just look at the constitutional space for struggle. Right? And that's even the argument with respect to 22. You're saying that you know, 22, the authorization of preventive detention should be limited by, by means of the way we interpret 21 and, and, and judicial interpretation 22 itself. So that's a broad kind of a framework I take. The second point I'd quickly make is uh, the point we can have a more radical approach. That's, that's very, very possible, right? But the point I'd really make is I think the phrase, the phase we are in now is how do we build as large a unity as possible, as large a coming together of people, of people as possible who are affected by this current regime? And who is affected by the regime? Again, the point of going back to it is I think it's very, very important to communicate in the, in the largest possible sense that the idea of totalitarianism affects diversity in all its hues and varieties. And any person who appreciates diversity, who's a part of a diverse community, diverse group, wants diversity in their life, should be deeply affected by this. Those who want to crack jokes should be affected by this. Those who want to those who, who want to pray in their homes need, will, will, in terms of the anti-conversion laws in, in Karnataka will be affected by this. And uh, a range of groupings, right? From I mean, again, the question came up in terms of what about communists, right? And, and I think the reference point I'll quickly make on this, Clifton referred to the Nazi examples in the book, and that's very key. Hitler's rise to power or Hitler's complete power was based on the fact that the, at that moment, the socialists and the communists were not able to come together. They saw each other as the greatest possible enemy. Again, it's very difficult to have a sense of historical perspective. It's not easy. When you're in the middle of something, you can't see outside the framework in which you are. So I think the, the imperative, I think the imperative of going to history and the imperative of going at the, looking at the lessons that say, hey, you know, this is what happened there. Is there something we can learn in terms of how we come together, setting aside our differences with the point that what we want to preserve is diversity. Again, going back to the point of, I mean, when you say genocide, right? The idea of genocide is this, that you can't tolerate diversity. Diversity will have to be eliminated. So our point is we, we are opposed fundamentally to genocidal ideology. And we want to be, in, in, the, in the words of our, our last speaker, to affirm that right to, right to happiness, which is the way in which we try and come together. Shara, could you like to say something? I uh, I actually just want to to add to what Clifton said, and and that's that's another question for Arvind. Uh, actually, also thank you, Clifton, for your for your kind words. But you were talking about how the bar is marginalized in a certain way or isolated if you're seen as 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 somebody who's who's a civil liberties lawyer, etc. But I'm I'm inundated, on the other hand, with with writs being filed or cases being filed, which appropriate the language of constitutional morality. And how does one respond to that? Like even while I'm talking to you, I've just got a message saying that um, writs have been filed in Uttarakhand High Court asking for quash of the Haridwar FIRs. There are writs in the Supreme Court uh, using the language of constitutional morality saying, you know, we have a problem of hate speech, but these are writs that have been filed by the Hindu Front for Justice, for instance, or by Ashwini Upadhyay, who's asking for strict laws against hate speech. How do you deal with appropriation of language? Um, there are a couple of questions on the chat box and a couple of people who've raised their hands. So I'll just collect these questions and perhaps uh, with those uh, answers, you could probably, we could probably have everyone's close, closing remarks. I'll ask Srikanta to go ahead. Srikanta, I have unmuted you. You can, you can go ahead with your question. Yes. I'm, just, I'm so sorry to keep saying this, but can you please keep your question short? Sure, sure, ma'am. Hello, it is audible. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Shrikanta, you're on mute. Um, can you go ahead with your question? Yes. Ma'am, uh, in Odisha, we see it is about 93 to 94% are Hindu. Uh, but it is a Hindu to is a strange uh, such things are for us. But I do find the board share of BJP in state like Delhi, where educators are more, but still we find the 
Hindutva ideology, like Uttar Pradesh and other states. So what is the reason behind it? And what is the reality of such Hindutva ideology? Exactly, all these are strands for people like in Odisha. Because we in Odisha, if you see saffron means it is all against Jagannath culture. It is mean against the Brahminism. But in saffron in the uh, North state, we find that it is against the always say uh, totalitarian thinking and uh, ex excluding the minorities. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Natasha, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, so I, I was just also want to briefly. Um, sorry, I'm not. It, my thoughts are not very formulated yet, but uh, it's. Uh, I wanted to. I think what uh, got me think like you know what, what uh, Kavita mentioned about uh, Prime Minister's speech and the question of rights and duties. And actually I've been thinking about that a lot. And, uh, you know, it, it the first thought of, uh, when I read that was like, you know, it, it seemed so familiar, uh, you know, this refrain. And then I, I then, it, you know, immediately my mind, uh, mind went back to, in the last two years, where have I heard this, you know, most? And it is, uh, was like, this was during our whole investigation by the Delhi police. Every day they were telling us the same thing. And then inside prison, every day we, we were hearing the same thing, you know? So it was, it was just like, it, it stuck me then, um, you know, and not necessarily by just people who really believe in the right-wing uh, ideology or the Hindutva ideology, but it's so ingrained, like this kind of, uh, you know, authoritarianism or this, uh, uh, you know, even, and then I was like, and where else do we hear this? It's like every day in our families, right? That uh, you cannot ask for anything, you know. You have to prioritize your duties, obedience, this. So it, it it's it's so uh, you know deep seated and rooted in our everyday lives that I think that is what also give like what uh, was being spoken about about the popularity of this regime and the connection every individual feels to this regime also comes from that. So uh, so in that sense. Then I, 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 it's just a thought that when, when, then when we talk about rights and we rely on, like you know, the uh, constitution and constitutional morality, uh, I think it, it some ways then, uh, though it of course, like as Arvin said, it, it, uh, the these rights and these uh, even the constitution itself has come from like you know this long history of struggle, this collective struggles. But somehow when we are arguing that in terms of, uh, you know, constitutional rights and morality, that gets somewhere out of the picture. And it's, it's like, you know, the constitution becomes as this thing which is giving us uh, all these rights rather than the other way that we have the people through a very long struggle have given themselves this constitution and through that this uh, these rights so when uh, we're talking about rights as uh, and Arvind I, I think also mentioned that it, it is we need to I think foreground that it is part of those collective struggles of people uh, against a certain kind of uh, you know authoritarian regimes of whatever nature be it colonialism be it like you know caste supremacy uh, be it uh, capitalist uh, against the uh, you know the uh, capitalist regimes so uh that was uh, that was one th i'm sorry i'm i think i'm not being very articulate here but uh, and the other thing which is linked to this is also i think the question which uh, uh arvin said about this this complete uh feeling of isolation and loneliness which kind of then also is going uh you know it it, it is being capitalized by the right wing uh and, uh, you know, because it gives this sense of a larger collective for which people, uh, you know, this need to belong to. And I think that's what I'm trying to say that when we are talking about rights, if, uh, if we are also able to give that sense of, 
you know this uh, this collective uh, that this is this is the space from which we are also talking about i think that is very very important and especially in today's context in this uh, post or not even post this current never ending pandemic world where the even these terms and isolation and loneliness is is you know this everyday vocabulary how do we uh, how do we imagine collectives anymore and politics anymore in that uh, uh, sense of being grounded in some collective uh, forms and which can give people this sense of like you know um, coming uh, and also belonging to a certain uh, larger than you know their individual selves uh, from which I think we have to really ground our struggles in, uh, and I think may, then that might not be the intention but what happens when we just talk about talk about rights and just in terms of the uh, coming from the constitution I think uh, we need to maybe slightly rethink more or think more on that and how we ground these questions and I don't know if it made any sense I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Natasha. Can I just say it made a lot of sense? So thank you so much. <laughs> um, before I uh, go and uh, before I go and give the mic to Gulam Nabi, uh, let me just ask two questions that are that are on the chat box. So Cyril asks, how can we galvanize to change the preventive detention through constitutional amendment laws and statutes to twenty four hour hours or arrest without trial to be only twenty four hours? I understand this is a Herculean task, though we must devise means or channel our energies to realize it. So please share your thoughts. Um, Venu Gopalan's question is, isn't the restriction of constitutional freedoms connected with the international discourse on war of terror, especially in the post September 11, 2001 world? Uh, questions related to Kashmir and those in Bhima Koregao, et cetera, seem somehow connected to this um, war on terror. I will request Mr. Gulam to ask his question. I've, un I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. And, um, and I think with this, uh, Oliver, I think Arvind then Sharuk, I'd really appreciate if you could uh, answer it and then give your closing thoughts. Thank you. Hello, hi everybody. Go ahead. Are you able to me? I'm, I'm so sorry, you're not yes. audible. Yes, Gulamji, you're audible. Yeah, it's audible. Yeah, yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Actually, the question is simple as simple as the constitution of the free in Kashmir. I think uh, it's not as an, less than an emergency like situation in Kashmir post 2019 until date. And as far as UAP is concerned, we're, we're more concerned with the detainees, we're more concerned with the people who are behind the bar, the extensions, the unnecessary extensions in demands, police demands, and all this. Uh, even, 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 even lawyers are, when lawyers are asking questions, that why they appear in these UAP questions, UAP, these cases, uh, and uh, why are they standing? Right now, my simple question is this: this thing, uh, only to this thing that I had put that question in, in box also, in chat also, that uh, this preventive detention, uh, as far as this preventive detention is concerned in Kashmir, uh, the provision there, the provision there in preventive detention, uh, preventive detention, right now, uh, uh, right now, about 20 years, I've seen this, the misuse of the preventive detention. Uh, only to this extent that people are kept behind the bar to incarcerate them themselves uh, inside. Uh, right now, I have gone through the book. Uh, through this book, there should have been something on the on 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 Kashmir, a chapter in this book on preventive detentions and this UAP right now in Kashmir because UAP uh, people are facing more and more UAP. Uh, this public safety is not there. Hope, you. hope you will uh, you will you will get my you get my question properly and yes thank you thank you so much um Arvind and Sharuk if you would like to respond then shall I go first Arvind and then you can do the closing remarks I I just have two very quick things to say 
one to Natasha, and <laughs> you were very articulate. Thank you for that intervention. I, I just want to, when you said, when you said it that way, I, I also remember that the entire case against the anti-CA protests in Delhi and the Delhi riots is anchored in two words, embarrassment and inconvenience. So again, they both derive from a sense of duty. How could you have embarrassed or how could you have tried to embarrass your country when Trump was visiting? And I mean, you know this better than me, but, but, but all of the interrogation, when students were called in and when teachers were called in, all of it was around this embarrassment, inconvenience, and where was your sense of duty? And again, the same judge who talked about burying uh, ADM Jabalpur 10 fathoms deep also has elevated inconvenience to the status of a fundamental right. So, so there is all of that. And finally, I've, I've noticed this for a while now that before the, the big declaration comes from the, the great man himself, there's always a, a, a little discursive activity, very, very frantic discursive activity on a subject. And I think it's been building for the last, last two or three years at least, this, this whole thing about duty. That's one. I also wanted to, to respond to Cyril. Uh, how do we uh, bring about any change in the law of, of pre-charge detention? I, I don't know, Cyril. I, I have no idea. But I think it is important to start to recognize that this is a problem, one, and perhaps start to talk about it more and more. I found a way to do that. Every panel that I'm invited to, I, I find a way to insert this, <laughs> whether it's relevant to the topic or not, which is what I did today. <laughs> well, thank you. That's, that's, that's all from me. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Mr. Mr. Gulam uh, Navikan for the, for the very, very important question. And uh, I agree with him that there must, there, there is a need for a chapter on Kashmir and a more full in-depth dealing with the, with the question of Kashmir. Because I think the Kashmir question throws a lot of what I was saying into question, right? Which is the entire question of the constitution and how you look at the constitution. Because we know for a fact that the constitution has very different status understood differently in the mainstream Indian context or in the mainland Indian context and in Kashmir. I mean, I, I know that for a fact. So how does one think of Kashmir within the context of civil liberties is a, is a challenge. And I think the one point might be, I mean, just to think about it, is the, again, Balgopal always made the point that uh, any Indian human rights meeting uh, within uh, any, any of the states, you'll be, every, every activist begins by a reference to the, the fundamental rights chapter and article 21, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas you go to any meeting in Kashmir, the reference point is the ICCPR or the ECSR. You're starting from that, that few points. So it's a very different starting point, point one. The second point is in terms of the, I mean, I don't know if I can make the same case with respect to the Indian Supreme Court, which I can make with respect to, uh, uh, in terms of the way the Indian Supreme Court has dealt with the, with the question of Kashmir. And the latest example, of course, which is the biggest failure is the, is the 370 case, but the many, many such instances, which tell you that, you know, there's been a longer history here and longer history, which I think needs to be examined, needs to be looked at. So I completely agree with you that it needs a longer looking into. The only place where Kashmir comes in, uh, in terms of, uh, in, in some detail, is the entire question of looking at the question of arrests. When I look at the question of arrests, I look at three three categories, which are the BK-16, look at the anti-CAA protesters, in, in, in particularly in, the, in, in, in Delhi. And so thirdly, I look at the question of Kashmir and, and the kind of uh, detentions which have which happen in, in Kashmir. But again, I'm, I'm very conscious that this is not adequate and a lot more work really needs to happen on that, on, on the question looking at the question of Kashmir and how Kashmir relates to the entire human rights question in the, in the, in the Indian framework. Uh, itself. Uh, and just the, on the, all the other questions, I'll just say thank you for all your thoughts and um, thoughts and comments. And as Shahrukh indicated, it's important to begin the sense of a conversation saying that, you know, we need to make this an issue. Pre-trial detention needs to be an issue. The hours you spend in, in police remand needs to be an issue. The easy granting of remand needs to be, needs to be an issue. And how do we make these issues? And, and maybe the answer lies in Shahrukh's invocation of, uh, of Netflix. Maybe there's a way in which culturally 
that 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 conversation is to open out you know culturally be it through art be it through literature be it through different ways we need to start talking about these issues maybe marshwada devi in madhur 1084 is one kind of an invocation but we need more such ways in which we start talking about these absolutely central and key issues which affect really the substance of what indian democracy should mean and, and uh, should mean going going forward in in, in the future Thank you, Arvind. Thank you, everyone. Sharuk, do you have anything to add before I close up? No, I think I think let Arvind have the last uh, last word. Okay. Thanks. Arvind, do you want to go ahead? Any last thoughts before I? No, I, no, I thought we had finished with the. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'll ask. Okay. Maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, what is the? Okay, one last word. Okay, one last. I'll just end on one last word, which is uh, the. Varugara Rao's poem, which I I quote somewhere I quote in the book, where he says uh, he's been imprisoned for numerous years, right? And like Natasha here, who's also so the fantastic inspiration, and he in this poem what he says is a political prisoner does not know the dis- meaning of despair, knows only the meaning of hope. If you keep that spirit in mind and take our work forward, going by the fact that you know these are not people saying it in easy circumstances, these are the most difficult circumstances. People are keeping the spirit alive. He's an example. Natasha Devangna, as well as uh, Asif, are great examples of that. The kind of spirit they showed. Sudarji and her smile when she was released. Again, that captured it for me. That was so fantastic just to see that that spirit, which is there in people in very very difficult circumstances. So I just say that we need to nourish that spirit in the time going forward. Thank you, thank you so much, Arvind and Sharuk, and everyone who had questions and participated today for such a rich, rich discussion. We've sent a link on the chat box to Arvind's book, so please do check it out. Uh, at Ilaj, we're constantly striving to create a space of resistance and dissent, much like what Arvind said. Ilaj is an open group, so if any of you would like to join us, please write to us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You can also email us at ilajhq at gmail.com. I'll put that on the chat box. Chat box. We have um, many, many such conversations planned as we did today in the near future. So we really hope all of you continue to attend. Uh, and thank you with this. Uh, Clifton, do you do you have something you would like to say? No, okay. Okay. No, no, no. Just very happy to see you. Oh. <laughs> no, thank you. No, you had such a white smile on your face, so I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Clifton, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shahrukh. Thank you, Arvind. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Arvind. Bye. 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 Bye.